end date and, uh, uh, and the team which uh, starts and ends. Epics are uh, large pieces of work, but they don't have a definitive start and end date. They're put into a portfolio and they're pulled in when the agile release train has the uh, capacity to pull them in. And then they're continuously prioritized using way short job first. Um, progress is measured again as outcomes. Um, they're they're uh, defined by the lean business case as opposed to a business requirements document. And so an Epic is not a project. A lot of companies start out with projects. I've, I've worked with, with companies that turn projects into Epics and, and that's very normal. But once you're starting um, going with the lean portfolio management, uh, Epic is not a project. So once we decide we have an Epic, we need to uh, define the EPIC hypothesis statement. So um, what is it we want to do? What is the current state? And what will the future state give us? Those are kind of the things that we need to define with the EPIC hypothesis statement. And then we need to also uh, define business outcomes. And, and this is uh, in, in lieu of technical outputs. It's critical that we talk at a business outcome level. And, and once again, um, using OKRs to define these business outcomes is becoming more and more popular. SAFE doesn't necessarily call for that, but, but I've talked to several coaches and, and have used that implementation where we, we uh, identify our business outcomes in the form of an OKR. And then leading indicators, that's the, uh, the concept of you using um, innovation accounting how can we measure at the earliest possible time whether our hypothesis is correct? And so this goes back to this um, lean startup movement. Even for really big things, we want to understand at the earliest possible time if we're on track or not on track. And then our non-functional requirements, those are the, uh, the scalability, security, um, all the different abilities that uh, um, are in the background. So then if uh, um, the lean portfolio management still likes what they're looking at, then it moves to the next level and it gets a go or no go. And so this is a two or three page document. This is as opposed to a several hundred page document. And so we're gonna take that information from the uh, Epic hypothesis and then put it in here and expand it to a little, a little bit more. You know, we're identifying in scope, out of scope. Um, we're gonna identify the minimum viable product in the form of features. We're going to estimate those features with a low precision and, and that would be ideally with points. And then we add up those points and that's going to be the cost of that epic in points. And so the go or no go decision by some uh, executives is going to be based on Point. So like an epic might be a thousand points. And if you've estimated uh, a point at a thousand dollars, which is pretty typical, it can be a little higher, it can be a little lower, but that's a normal starting point. So a thousand point epic would be a million dollar initiative. So you think a million dollar initiative better get approval at a pretty high level. And so that's where the lean business case comes into play. And so it's going to have uh, um, this amount of uh, analysis and uh, decisioning. Then once it's approved, um, we need to uh, identify our future vision to communicate to folks. And one of the ways to do that is uh, a postcard from the future. If uh, um, any of you have heard of the, uh, the John Deere video, I would strongly urge you to go Google it uh, or YouTube it. It, uh, uh, it talks about uh, what farming is going to look like in the future. And it was made in 2012 and it's amazing how close they've come to the future. And so that's the kind of aspirational, uh, motivating um, uh, communication of, of the future vision. So establishing lean budgets and guardrails, that's still part of uh, strategy investment funding. So it uh, lean budgets, it, uh, um, Rather than a uh, budget for projects, we want to assign that budget to the entire value stream. So a value stream might cost, it, it should, it'll be a, a fairly uh, fixed cost. So say you have, um, I'll just make this up, 15 teams, 
you add up the salaries of everybody on that as a release train, and that's going to be your uh, run the business cost of that value stream. And so we're going to budget for that value stream. And then the work that they pull in, well, that will be prioritized and decided by the portfolio. So we're not budgeting for a particular project. We're budgeting for that value stream. And then that budget can be uh, reviewed and adjusted on a, on a cadence. Uh, what is common is uh, twice a year. So it uh, uh, every six months, we'll take a look at uh, the, the value stream budget and, and make adjustments as necessary. So uh, like I said, we're going to get away from funding projects and we're going to fund the value streams. There's a lot of benefit to doing that. Uh, and so to uh, uh, follow through with the lean budget guardrails, we're going to do four different things. We're going to uh, um, identify epics by uh, horizon and we're going to apply capacity allocation. We're going to uh, approve significant initiatives with a, a lean startup and, uh, and then we're going to have continuous business engagement. So guiding by horizon. So that's where every uh, um, initiative is going to be given a particular horizon. So like horizon zero is decommissioning. We're going to get rid of this old system. Uh, we're going to retire it in the next year. So we don't want to spend too much money on it. Um, horizon one, that's going to be currently uh, getting revenue or um, soon to be getting revenue. And then horizon two is is uh, over the horizon and then horizon three could be um, far out in the future but we still want to do some research onto it and so it uh, at every um, on a cadence you want to take a look at those large projects and and decide what percentage of our funding is going to go into which horizon 